please silence any electronic devices and remain seated throughout the entire presentation. Nature is facing an unprecedented challenge. We must come together as never before to turn things around. Uh, geographic uh, region. Starting off with our Amazonia Conservation Hub. The wildlife that San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance and its partners focus on in this region include Andean bears, New World monkeys, jaguars, as well as the, the habitats that they share. There are many birds in the Amazon that need our help. Macaws are very social birds that live in pairs in flocks in the rainforest of Central and South America. But unfortunately, the majority of them are endangered. But everybody, please welcome our flock of macaws. Wow. Making their way in first is Cielo and Sol, our scarlet macaws. They are one of our pear bonnet birds. Macaws can live up to about 50, 60, 70 years of age. Oh, and there's Diego, our green wing macaw. He's going to be showing off his wingspan in just a second. And then over here to my, your left, is Sierra and Azul, our blue and gold macaws. Look at them go. Macaws can travel up to 
15 miles in a day searching for some of their favorite snacks. Um, some of those are different fruits and veggies. We're very squawky today. Uh, fruits and veggies, especially nuts. They are all designed um, to open up nuts using those very big, thick bills of theirs. Those beaks are very, very strong. And as you can hear, those squawks are very loud. Um, this is very necessary for them to communicate in the dense rainforests of Central and South America. Now, the Amazon is a very big ecosystem, but it's one of the ecosystems that is uh, quickly diminishing due to a lot of human encroachment. There you go, bud. Uh, but one of the things that you can do to help out these beautiful birds is buy what you buy in the grocery store. How many of you like coffee in the morning? Yeah, I got a handful of you. I know, I love my, my cup of coffee in the morning as well. Well, did you know that their specific type of coffee that can help out the Amazon it is called shade grown coffee. It is coffee that is grown under the canopy of the trees. So the trees don't have to be taken down. So it's a win-win. You've got the habitat left for all the amazing animals, as well as we get our coffee in the morning. Well, did you know uh, macaws will actually go back to that very same tree from when they left in the morning. So let's make sure that that tree is still there when they return. That was our beautiful flock of macaws, everyone. All right, we're going to be heading on over to our Southwest Conservation Hub. The wildlife that Santa Zoo Wildlife Alliance and its partners are focusing on in, the, in this region include the western burring owl, the desert tortoise, the kino checker spot butterfly, the mountain yellow legged frog, and the thick billed parrot, as well as plant life like the boujum, the coastal scrub oak, and the tory pine. Now, this next wildlife ambassador you might literally find in your own backyard. Please welcome Richard, our Virginia opossum. Here he comes. How many of you have had one of these in your backyard? Yeah, handful. <laughs> Now, uh, Virginia opossums are the only native marsupial to North America, which means the females have a pouch to carry their young just like kangaroos do. Now, um, they are a very misunderstood species. A lot of people think that they're gross and scary. Well, I am here to tell you today that they are amazing. Did you know that they can get bitten by a rattlesnake and, and live to actually eat that rattlesnake? Yeah. Um, scientists have actually identified a special peptide in their, their blood that helps neutralize that venom. Um, we are very hopeful that one day we will have a universal anti-venom all because of the opossum. Now they're also very helpful in your gardens. Um, they will take care of any of those rotten fruits and veggies or even all those pesky bugs that go after your vegetables in your garden. Um, like caterpillars, any type of beetle, bug, and especially ticks. Any of you like ticks out here? I hope not. I mean, they all have their place in the ecosystem, okay? <laughs> um, but opossums can actually eat up to 5,000 ticks in one season. Wow. Yeah. So um, this is very helpful in areas where Lyme disease is very prevalent. I think he might be done. Are you still chewing? Okay, still chewing. Now, how many of you have ever heard of playing possum? Yeah, or playing dead. Um, this is a really cool adaptation that they have where if they feel frightened, they will actually play dead. Um, this is an involuntary response where they'll flip over, their tongue will hang out, their heart rate will even slow down. They even give off a gross smell. And this is in the hopes of um, for predators to not eat them. Most predators don't really like to eat things that have already passed away. So they've got some pretty amazing uh, superpowers, as I like to say, uh, for being an opossum. They help us survive Lyme disease, they can survive rattlesnake bites, and they can even play dead. Well, this is my favorite part, dining and dashing. There he goes. That was Richard, our Virginia opossum. All right, well, our next wildlife ambassador represents our One Health approach to saving wildlife worldwide. 
the health of people, wildlife, and the environment are all interconnected. Our planet can only thrive when all life thrives. That's the core of our mission, and it's the thread that runs through all of our conservation efforts. Now, this next wildlife ambassador is one of the largest owl species in the world. So everyone, please wow. welcome Einstein, our Eurasian eagle owl. about it. Here she comes. Nice. She's got about a five foot wingspan. Now did anybody hear her flap when she came down? No. Don't be surprised by that. Um, owls are very good at hunting at night and what helps them do that is they have essentially silent flight. If you notice on the edge of her feathers there, she's got an extra little fringe and this allows the air to pass right on through, essentially giving her that silent flight. So her prey does not even hear her coming. Oh, she's still eating her yummy snacks? Yeah, we're taking our time, yep. <laughs> now, um, another one of their amazing senses is their eyesight. They have extremely good uh, far-sighted vision. So you can see she flew from all the way up there and you can see that mouse from all the way down there. Pretty incredible. Uh, but like I said, they primarily hunt during the nighttime. Um, and so hearing is extremely helpful as well. They have what we call asymmetrical ears, where they essentially have one kind of towards the top of their head and one kind of towards the bottom. And this allows them to triangulate where their prey is. So they don't necessarily need to see them in order to find them when they are hunting. Now back to her eyes, that's probably one of the things that you've noticed about her when she flew down. They're extremely big and beautiful, but this is only about a third of her eyeball that you can actually see. Um, the shape of her eyeball is actually like a light bulb, and the part that you're seeing is the part of the light bulb where you would screw into the socket. So that's not even the biggest part. If we were to have the same size eyes um, as she does, we'd essentially have eyeballs the size of our fists in our head. Yeah, wow, yeah. <laughs> and so you probably notice they are fixed. They can't move side to side or up and down like ours can. Um, and that's because they are so big. Uh, but, oh, she's just giving National Geographic over here. Oh, down the hatch. Okay, awesome. <laughs> they do swallow their prey whole. They might shred them a little bit, but they swallow everything. The bones, the fur, and all that. And guess what? They will regurgitate back up the, all the fur and the bones in a really cool little pellet called owl pellets. Kids, and I think in uh, fifth or sixth grade, you might be able to dissect them in school. It's pretty fun. And you can, um, it's actually very helpful with scientists and research, researchers. Um, it allows them to know what they are eating out there in their native habitat. Now, having those fixed, oh gosh, you're just holding it there. It's adorable. I'm <laughs> sorry. Always get distracted. In the, makes for great pictures, right? <laughs> What are you staring at? You already have your mouth. It's in your mouth. There you go. Down the hatch. Um, now, having those big eyeballs being fixed in their head, they've actually adapted to be able to move their head about three quarters of the way around. Um, and how they can do this is they actually have twice as many, many vertebrae in their neck than mammals do. So all of this from mice to me to giraffes all have seven vertebrae. Owls have 14. So twice as many. And it actually changes the shape of their neck. It's kind of like a backwards S and it allows them to corkscrew back and forth uh, when they are looking around. <laughs> they don't have the greatest uh, nearsighted vision, so. <laughs> she's like, where are you calling me? Um, she's giving you actually a great view of her camouflage. Um, Eurasian eagle owls are found in Europe and Asia in the forested regions there. So her feather coloration uh, helps her blend in like trees, like the bark of trees. So very well camouflaged. <gasps> and there she goes. Well, that was Einstein, our Eurasian eagle owl, everyone. All right, thank you very much, Jessica. And of course, Einstein. Well, hi, my name is Katie, and I'm another wildlife care specialist, and we are going to be moving into our Amazonia Conservation Hub. You met those macaws that need the trees of the rainforest to live? Well, 
this next wildlife ambassador does as well. And he is one of our newest members. And please welcome him out. If you look over there, I think, where Shauna's coming out. This is Tornero, our Linnaeus two-toed sloth. <laughs> and like I mentioned, he is one of our newest animal ambassadors. He just turned three not too long ago in April. His mom and dad here do live at the zoo as well. Now, sloths are known to be slow, but when Tornero gets moving, he gets going pretty quick. He'll probably make it back and forth on this vine a couple times, especially when it's after something that he loves. One of his favorite treats are hibiscus flower and also purple star flower, as well as yam and eggplant, one of his favorite things. Now, eggplant, it is raw. I usually might like mine breaded and fried with cheese and marinara, but he likes it just raw. Now, they do live on low nutritious plants out there uh, in the rainforest or the Amazon where they're from, and they do live very high up in the tree canopies. But sloths do something that's a little unusual. They only go to the bathroom once a week. <laughs> and they usually sometimes make that journey all the way down to the forest floor <laughs> to do that. <laughs> Sloths don't have a lot of uh, adaptations or a lot of defenses against predators. Harpy eagles and large uh, cats might be something that might want to make a sloth a meal. Well, they sometimes will sit up high in the trees and algae grows on them or mosses. And when they sit in that tree like a lump, a predator may just fly, or walk on by and not even know the sloth is there. Now he's called a two-toed Linnaeus sloth because he has two toenails on, that, on those front feet. You can see his back feet have three toenails. And look at the way he's moving on that vine right now. See how he matches the back feet up? Oh, he did a little different that way. Oh, he's looking for Shauna for some treats. He'll put that front foot and then his back foot meets up with the front foot. And that helps him to guide through those high forests that he lives in. Now I mentioned that his mom and dad are here. Tornero was born right here and we had the opportunity to help rear him. We co-reared him with his mother and started building a bond with him when he was very young. You can see that his hair grows. Sloths are, are uh, built to live upside down. You can see his hair on his stomach actually is where his part is and his hair grows down that way. Now, if you're asking yourself, what can you do to help out uh, animals that live in the Amazon or really anywhere else in the world, everybody knows reduce, reuse, and recycle. But did you know there is a new R and that is refuse, just like Tornero did right there now. <laughs> What refuse means is, you know, when you're getting food maybe to go and usually they give you lots of napkins, lots of forks, maybe some straws, just say no thank you. Just by saying no thank you to that can really go a long way to help reduce plastic and trash around the world. Now another way you can help out animals that need trees to survive is something called the Forestry Stewardship Council. You can look for the logo right there, FSC. And you can find it on most paper products. And in fact, I've been finding it quite a bit. The recent find I found, so you can find it on toilet paper, maybe uh, brown paper bags, but also on my pizza box that I at home saw that it was FSC. And what that means is that the paper is sustainably resourced for those products. So you can actually help out animals maybe just by feeding your pizza today. But Tornero, gonna hang around for a little while I think no pun intended <laughs> and uh, keep cruising with his wildlife care specialist and we are going to introduce another wildlife ambassador who is from our one health uh, conservation hub and this is Justine our North American beaver <laughs> making her way out here Justine just celebrated her 12th birthday. Yay! And she came to us when she was about nine months old and we have been creating a bond with her ever since. She's gonna be munching on some of her favorite treats, which is apple, there's some rodent trout, trout, and yam and jicama. 
Now, she is an aquatic rodent. They are also the largest species of rodent uh, in North America. I'll give a little quiz. Does anybody know what the largest species in the world is of rodent? Capybara! That is correct. And you are fortunate enough that if you can go over by our elephants, you'll get to see some of those wildlife ambassadors as well. <clears throat> So I was saying she's an aquatic rodent. She has adaptations which help her to live by the water or in the water. So she has eyelids that are clear. So she kind of has her own goggles. So when she's swimming around, maybe looking for some water plants to chew on, or maybe find some of the wood that she stashed in the pond, she can see through the water. She also has a thick coat. And in fact, she can be swimming for hours and her skin won't even be wet. She also can hold her breath for 15 minutes. <laughs> Pretty impressive. And the reason they can do that is to once again get away from predators. Just like Tornero grows moss and algae on him to hide, she's gonna hide from those predators as well. And when she's living on her pond, there might be other beavers around and even uh, kits from the year before. Oh, she's gonna walk up on her back feet. Pretty agile like that. They've been seen carrying stacks of wood to their uh, dens. And she uses, oh, she's gonna go in the water. Is she gonna go in? She uses that tail as a rudder. But when she's going underwater, if something makes her nervous or scared, she'd slap that tail, go underwater, and hold her breath for 15 minutes. Let's see if she's gonna do it. Gotta see the beaver go in the water. There it is! <laughs> Now, uh, she's still gonna follow her wildlife care specialist here and she'll swim around, but you can see she's pretty agile in the water. They can get up to five miles per hour. Now, beavers are what known is are what known as a keystone species. And what that means is she is important to a whole environment. If beavers are there, they help out other animals, even endangered animals, but along those ponds that they build, they can have spots for migratory birds to make nests, they can have spots for fish to breed, and they have a water source for all other animals. She's gonna go hang out under there and swim around, I think, too. That was Justine, our North American beaver. Well, San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance is creating a world where all life thrives, and never has it been more important. As first responders in the field, we are there with a century worth of knowledge, uh, applying that to global conservation challenges. We innovate, we collaborate, we inspire for people and wildlife to thrive together for a healthy planet. But we couldn't do it alone. We need dedicated allies like you. You can join San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance by becoming a member. You can volunteer your time. You can donate to conservation projects. There's so much you can do to help us out. But your help means a world of difference to us because when wildlife thrives, all life thrives. Enjoy the rest of your day right here at the San Diego Zoo. Bye-bye.